Hello, I'm Greg Pollock, and you're watching the 14th episode of the Scaling Rails screencast series sponsored by New Relic. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at Rack and Metal and how these two libraries help us scale our Rails app. The newest version of New Relic RPM comes with AppDeck support, which is a vendor-neutral independent standard for measuring your user's satisfaction with the responsiveness of your application. I know it's a mouthful. Basically, if a client comes to you and says, I think the application is slow today, you can quickly look at the AppDex graph to see if that's true or not. Now, before we get going, we need to make sure everybody knows exactly what Rack is. If you already know, bear with me, we'll get through it real quick. So Rack, in its very basic form, sits in between your web frameworks and whatever you're serving your web framework on. So if I build my web framework and I interface it with the Rack library, I then can serve my framework out of any of these web servers that also support Rack. The basic anatomy of a Rack application looks something like this. This is saying that we need to declare a call method which returns status, headers, and body. Now we're going to look at a quick screencast which will show us a very, very basic Rack application. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to declare a class. It's going to be, you know, hello because we're creating hello world. There's that call method and it returns status, headers, and body. Okay, cool. Now we need to serve this Rack application. So we're going to declare a Rack handler, serve it off of Mongrel, send an instance of the hello class, and serve it off port 3000. That's all there is to it. We then go to the command line, run our Rack application. Then we can go to the browser, go to port 3000, and there's our Hello World. That's a basic Hello World application. Now, if you looked around the internet before about, you know, it's Hello World Rack applications, you may have seen them use a Lambda. A Lambda is an anonymous function in Ruby, and in order to invoke a Lambda, we use the call method, right? It's the same method that um, Rack expects, right? So we should be able to write a very, very simple Rack app just by wrapping our status, headers, and body in a Lambda, just like that. And just send in that application, run the server again, and if we refresh, we get basically the same thing. So we can either use a Lambda or a class. And now that we know what Rack is, what exactly is Rack middleware? Well, a good metaphor is that game called uh, Telephone that you used to play when you were a kid. You know, where one person whispers to the next person, whispers to the next person, and by the time it gets to the end, it has no resemblance of what it started out with? Right. Well, that's kind of like what we're doing with Rack Middleware, except, of course, we're using an HTTP request, which then gets passed forward into maybe some profiling middleware, and then to some security middleware, and then maybe to some caching middleware, and only if it reaches through all three levels of middleware does it then get to our application. Now you might be wondering, what's going on inside each of these pieces of middleware? Well, just like Rack has a basic anatomy, so does Rack middleware, and it looks a little bit like this. Each piece of Rack middleware has an initialize method, which sends in an app, and a call method. We're going to be using some symbols to identify the call definition and then the call forward to the next piece of middleware. So we've got the star and the arrow because we're going to be looking at a lot of pieces of rack middleware. So if we wanted to manipulate the response, if we wanted to modify the incoming request before we call forward, we could do it here. If we wanted to manipulate the response back from you know, our application, we would then insert some code down there. So if we looked inside each of these Rack middleware libraries, we would see that each has a call definition and then a call forward to the next piece of Rack middleware. So one calls the next, which calls the next, and then reaches all the way to our Rails application. And then once we have a response, it then travels back through the stack and back out to our client. As you may already know, Rails 2.3 now has Rack support which is great, so we can put in our own pieces of Rack middleware inside Rails 2.3. If you watched a previous screencast, the one where I talked about reverse proxy caching, in there we used the uh, Rack cache middleware so that we had a reverse proxy cache in front of our Rails application. So, as a request came in, first it would hit our reverse proxy. If we had something in cache, it would just return it there, but if it didn't have it in cache, then it would go and hit our Rails application. 
If you take a look on GitHub, you're going to find there's already a lot of Rack middleware out there which you can use with your application. Um, some of them aren't going to be too useful with Rails because they contain functionality that Rails already has, but some of them might be useful for your application. The question then becomes, um, where in the Rack stack does something go, right? Because obviously I've got, I might have many pieces of middleware. Where does each piece go? And then more importantly, really, what is in the Rails Rack stack? We need to get familiar with the Rails Rack stack if we're going to be, um, you know, putting in our own pieces of middleware at, at different locations. So if you downloaded Rails 2.3 and you ran the command rake middleware, you would get a list of all the middleware that Rails has right out of the box. Well, that's interesting. I wonder where each of these pieces of Rack middleware gets loaded from. And more importantly, what do they all do? Well, if we took a look inside Action Controller Dispatcher, we would find a line that looks like this. So interesting, there's a middleware RB file, which it looks like it's just calling instance of Allon. Well, if we took a look inside that file, we might see something that looks like this. Okay, so there's all of our pieces of rack middleware. Hmm. Well, let's go through these one at a time and see if we can figure out what each of them does. First up, we have rack lock. It looks like this piece of middleware only gets loaded if we're not allowing concurrency. Hmm, maybe it has something to do with threading. So if we take a look inside lock.rb, we would see this. So there's our call definition, there's our call forward, and it looks like we're just doing one big synchronize command around the request. So this is making sure that well, we're only allowing one thread to execute through Rails at a time and not allowing true concurrency. Makes sense. Next up, we've got failsafe. Okay, let's take a look inside failsafe.rb. There's our call definition. There's our call forward through the rest of the rack middleware stack. And looks like we just have an exception down here. Okay. So basically, if an error happens somewhere in our rack middleware stack or in our dispatching, it's going to catch the exception here and render the failsafe response. Now, if we're a client, that means we're going to see this, you know, dreaded page here. Um, in our console, we're going to see something that looks like this to let us know we have a failsafe error. And uh, yeah, you should keep in mind here that you only see this if rescue.rb is missed. So all of your normal Rails rescue methods, if, they, if those miss, then you're going to get this message instead. Next up, we've got some session store middleware. And you know, Rails by default out of the box uses the cookie store. So let's take a look at the cookie store middleware. There's our call method. And looks like we've got a, a session hash we're declaring here, which is our session key. We then do our call forward. And on the response, oh, hey, check that out. We're building a cookie which contains our session items to send back to our client. Cool. So we build that cookie and just send that right back. Makes sense. Next up, we've got the params parser. Let's see what this does. Well, it looks like we're declaring two different param parsers, one for XML, one for JSON. There's our call definition. There's our call forward. So it looks like we're doing something to the request before we call forward in our stack. And it looks like we're just parsing the formatted parameters. So if we get parameters, they're in XML format or JSON format. Let's go ahead and um, translate them into normal parameters that we would expect from a web page. Makes sense. Next up, we've got rack method override. Let's figure out what this does. OK, it looks like we've got our HTTP methods. There's our call definition and our call forward in the rack stack. So it looks like we're doing something to the request. OK, so if we're doing a post request. Oh, so now we're getting the underscore method parameter. Now, I think back for a second, if you've ever looked at the source of a form when you're doing a put or delete, you're going to recognize that underscore method parameter, right? That's where we sort of, you know, say that we're going to be doing a put or delete. So if this is a proper HTTP method, ah, then set the request method equal to, I guess that would be put or delete. Oh, interesting. So this piece of middleware basically sets the proper request method. You know, our browsers don't know how to do a put or delete. 
but this way we look for the underscore method parameter and set the proper request method so it looks like our browser knows how to do put and delete to our Rails application at least. Next up we've got rack head. <laughs> what does this do? If we open up head RB, there's our call definition. Okay, so it looks like we're going to be doing something to the response, right? So if request method is head, ah, then we're just clearing out the body. Because if you're familiar with the HTTP spec, you know that head requests never can return a body. So here we're just stripping it out. Cool. So that's our Rails rack stack. Just to review, let's go over each of these really quick. So rack lock creates a lock around the request if we're not allowing concurrency. Uh, failsafe is that last resort 500 error. Um, then we persist our session information with our session rack middleware. Then we have params parser, which is going to parse params from XML and JSON. Then we have method override to set the proper method. And lastly, we've got rack head, which clears the body if somebody does a head request. Now, if you are really observant, you may have noticed that the middleware.rb file is missing some of the pieces of middleware that we saw when we ran rake middleware from the command prompt. What's missing? Well, these two little lines down here. So you might then ask, where did these two pieces of code come from? Let's see if we can figure that out. So here's the two sneaky pieces of middleware. And if we take a look inside the initializer.rb, we're going to see a function called initialize database middleware, which contains configuration middleware insert before session store connection management. Okay, so what this is saying is um, in our rack middleware stack, insert connection management before session store. Cool. And there's also another line here where we insert query cache before session store as well. But what do these do, right? We've got to figure out what these do. First of all, connection management. There's our call definition. There's our call forward. So we're doing something to the response. Oh, and we're just ensuring that at the end of a request that we return all active connections to the database. Makes sense. Next up, we've got query cache. What's query cache doing? There's our call definition. And... Okay, we're just uh, wrapping it in the block, in a cache block, our call forward. So this is where um, Active Record caches the common queries that happen more than once during the same request. So that's your Rails rack stack. And now that you know what each of these items do, hopefully you're comfortable enough to be able to insert your own pieces of rack middleware, know where they go, or maybe even replace some of these pieces of rack middleware with your own stuff. Now, by default, if I use that, you know, config middleware use item in my environment.rb, it's going to insert it right there. So that's where our pieces of middleware will go by default. But remember, there's a couple commands that we can use to define where we want our pieces of middleware to go in our stack. The first of which, of course, you know, by default, the use middleware option, which you just saw where that went. Then we can use insert after, which we saw. And we can also do middleware swap if we want to swap out a piece of middleware with one of our own. Next up, we're going to be talking about Rails Metal, which is a new feature in Rails 2.3, and figure out how it allows us to scale our Rails applications. Metal is basically for optimizing actions using rack endpoints. Well, what does that mean? Don't worry, I've got a screencast. So here we've got a basic Rails application. We're going to be entering a uh, game score. So we've got team names in there. So Giants 14, Broncos 24, we create that. Now I'm going to have several applications that want this data maybe like my iPhone app that wants to pull down the game score or maybe I've got a thick app that does. So I want to be able to pull this information in JSON format. Okay so I'm going to go to my application, go to the show action, and I'm going to add the JSON format to return the game score. Cool. So there we go. Now I've got the JSON format with the information that I need. Now if we benchmark this Rails application as is with 3,000 requests to get the game score, we would see that it takes 18 seconds to complete. It might do 167 requests per second and each request is going to take 6 milliseconds. Now that's pretty fast but might not be fast enough if we've got millions of applications polling for this data. Now let's go ahead and optimize this using a metal endpoint.
Now Metal has a generator for us to get started. And we're going to be calling this Metal Library QuickScore. Okay, so that creates a basic Metal Library for us. If we open that up, we can see, uh, you should be able to recognize in here, you see the call definition? Yeah, you should recognize that. We look to see if the path info contains QuickScore. If it does, we return um, some JSON here. And we're just going to query for the active record object. And if we don't find that, then you might notice it here, it returns a 404. Okay, so we do that, then we're going to go ahead and start up a server. And now we should be able to just go to QuickScore. And there's our JSON. Now, if we go ahead and benchmark this using the same 3000 request, we're going to see that it only takes 7.2 seconds to complete. It can do 398 requests per second, and each request only takes 2.5 milliseconds to run. Well, we're getting faster. However, if we really wanted to optimize, we should probably remove active record out of the equation altogether and simply use the database connection. Well, what might that look like? So here again is our quick score library. And there's our call definition. So we give it a little star. Cool. And we check to see if the path info is quick score. And here's where we do the query. Now, how might we optimize that? What we might do here is to figure out the SQL, the raw SQL, and then just use the active record connection to get that data back in a um, hash and then just call to JSON on that hash. Okay. So if we do that in our method, in our piece of metal, we now get things even faster. So metal without active record now takes 5.6 seconds to complete, can do 534 requests per second, and only takes 1.9 milliseconds per request. Even faster. Pretty cool. However, now that you're familiar with the Rails rack stack, you might be wondering, you know, as soon as I run script generate metal polar, where in the Rails rack stack is this metal library going to be hit? How far up? Well, it turns out it's right about here, right after cookie score and right before params parser. That's where your Rails application is going to be looking for metal endpoints. But how is that piece of middleware getting in there? Let's take a look at the code. Well, it looks like we've got an insert before. So, look okay, at this is interesting. If there are any pieces of rack metal, then load the Rails rack metal middleware. <laughs> That's a mouthful, but it's interesting to see how that works. And if we take a look inside the metal.rb library, we can see, okay, there's our call definition, there's our call forward, and it looks like it's just going through each metal endpoint, calling it, um, returning the result, unless it returns a 404. If it returns a 404, well, then we're either going to call the next piece, uh, the next metal endpoint, or we're just going to go to the next step in our Rails rack middleware stack. So hopefully this statement makes a little bit more sense when I tell you that Metal is for optimizing actions using rack endpoints. In conclusion, hopefully with this tutorial, you're now more comfortable with the Rails rack stack and you're not afraid of getting your hands dirty and creating your own custom stack. You know, it's interesting. We talk about being able to customize Rails and that really sounds like we're almost sort of talking about Rails 3, which is making it so that you really can pick and choose the different components you want to use with Rails. You're also now familiar with Rails Metal, which would allow you to optimize certain actions that need to be extra snappy in your Rails applications. <sighs> Looks like we've reached the end of another Scaling Rails screencast. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.